the next video people wanted to watch is okay so this is the fermi paradox which is a one of those things that a lot of people will use in order to i guess prove that aliens or at least intelligent life isn't real um so let's quickly are this. we the only living things in the entire universe the observable universe is about 90 billion light years in diameter there are at least 100 billion galaxies each with 100 to 1000 billion stars Recently, we've learned That's that planets are very common too, and there are probably trillions and trillions of habitable planets in the universe, which means there should be lots of opportunity for life to develop and exist, right? Yeah. But where is it? Shouldn't the universe be teeming with spaceships? Let's take a step back. Even if there are alien civilizations in other galaxies, there's no way we'll ever know about them. Basically, everything outside of our direct galactic neighborhood, the so-called local group, is pretty much out of our reach forever because of the expansion of the universe. Even if we had really fast spaceships, it would literally take billions of years to reach these places, traveling through the emptiest areas in the universe. So let's focus on the Milky Way. The Milky Way is our home galaxy. Okay, but that's sort of saying that warp drives is impossible, right? Th that's the argument there. Because it's taking into account that the only way you could get somewhere, or the only way that you could get from one planet to another that is in a different galaxy uh, would be to travel there. So the way that we would travel to Mars. But that's only if warp drives is impossible. And Elon Musk, uh, I was watching this interview with Elon Musk uh, like a few months ago, where they straight up asked him, is it possible, is, is it possible for us to build warp drives? And Elon Musk said, yes. The issue we have right now is we don't have a fuel source for that. Because you would effectively need the entire energy signature of Jupiter. So you would need to consume Jupiter in order to warp. So if you wanted to go, if you wanted to go at warp, that's how much energy you would need. We don't have that much energy. So unless you have uh, multiple Jupiters that you can just continuously consume, you don't, you're not going to be able to do that. So we have to find a different way of doing it. We have to find a different type of uh, fuel source. But theoretically speaking, we could build a warp drive. And warp would effectively mean that time no longer matters. So it's not going to take you billions of years to get from one galaxy to another. It's going to take an instant because that's literally what warp is. You're moving space. You're no longer moving in space, you're just moving space. You're just going uh, to another galaxy. It's like, it's going to be near instant. It consists of up to 400 billion stars. That's a lot of stars. Counting one per second, it would take you a hundred lifetimes to count them all. There are about 20 billion sun-like stars in the Milky Way, and estimates suggest that a fifth of them have an Earth-sized planet in its habitable zone, the area with conditions that enable life to exist. Okay. If uh, Chrysan, how you doing, bro? Thanks for the first chat, really appreciate that. What do you mean, what gate? Only 0.1% of those planets harbored life, there would be one million planets with life in the Milky Way. Jesus. But wait, there's more. The Milky Way is about 13 billion years old. In the beginning, it would not have been a good place for life because things exploded a lot. But after one to two billion years, the first habitable planets were born. Earth is only four billion years old, so there have probably been trillions of chances for life to develop on other planets in the past. If only a single one of them had developed into a space-traveling super-civilization, we would have noticed by now. What would such a civilization look like? There are three categories. A Type 1 civilization would be able to access the whole energy available on its planet. In case you're wondering, we're currently around 0.73 on the scale, and we should reach Type 1 sometime in the next couple of hundred years. Type 2 would be a civilization capable of harnessing all of the energy of its home star. 
This would require some serious science fiction, but it is doable in principle. Concepts like the Dyson Sphere, a giant complex surrounding the Sun, would be conceivable. Type 3 is a civilization that basically controls its whole galaxy and its energy. An alien race this advanced would probably be godlike to us. But yep. why should we be able to see such an alien yeah. civilization in the- Can I get an effing chat for Earth and humanity? We're not even a fucking one and we've come up with the system. Like, we named the system, right? And we we can't even do a one? Like, what the fuck? They could have at least started us at a one. Like, say one is someone who kind of almost uses all of its energy sources available to it, right? Like, that's a one. We're a one. Woo! We, we're not even on one. Like, that is sad as fuck. <laughs> First place. If we were to build generation spaceships that could sustain a population for around 1,000 years, we could colonize the whole galaxy in 2 million years. Sounds like a long time, but remember, the Milky Way is huge. So if it takes a couple of million years to colonize the entire galaxy, and there are possibly millions, if not billions, of planets that sustain life in the Milky Way, and these other life forms have had considerably more time than we've had, then where are all the aliens? This is the Fermi Paradox, and nobody has an answer to it. But we do have some ideas. Let's talk about filters. A filter in this context represents a barrier that is really hard for life to overcome. They come in various degrees of scary. One, there are great filters, and we have passed them. Maybe it is way harder for complex life to develop than we think, the process allowing life to begin hasn't yet been completely figured out and the conditions required may be really complicated. Maybe in the past, the universe was way more hostile and only recently have things cooled down to make complex life possible. This would also mean that we may be unique or at least one of the first, if not the first, civilization in the entire universe. Two, there are great filters and they are ahead of us. This one would be really, really bad. Maybe life on our uh, level exists really everywhere in the universe, but it gets destroyed when it reaches a certain point, a point that lies ahead of us. For example, awesome future technology exists, but when activated, it destroys the planet. The last words of every advanced civilization would be, this new device will solve all of our problems once I push this button. If this is true, then we are closer to the end than the beginning of human existence. Or maybe there is an ancient Type 3 civilization that monitors the universe, and once a civilization is advanced enough, it gets eliminated in an instant. Maybe there is something out there that it would be better not to discover. There is no way for us to know. One final thought, yeah. maybe we're alone. Right now, we have no evidence that there's any life besides us. Nothing. The universe appears to be empty and dead. No one sending us messages, no one answering our calls. We may be completely alone, trapped on a tiny moist mud ball in an eternal universe. Does that thought scare you? If it does, you're having the correct emotional reaction. If we let life on this planet die, perhaps there will be no life left in the universe. Life will be gone maybe forever. If this is the case, we just have to venture to the stars and become the first Type 3 civilization to keep the delicate flame of life existing and to spread it until the universe breathes its final breath and vanishes into oblivion. The universe is too beautiful not to be experienced by someone. This video was made possible uh, by your... I would say the only problem I have with the Fermi Paradox, insofar as, as it's been explained here, is <clears throat> it makes a, a, a massive number of assumptions, okay? Uh, and then based on those assumptions, it then says that it would be impossible, as I've already explained. Uh... So when you argue against the Fermi uh, uh, Paradox, you have to argue based on the assumptions that have been made. So you have to argue that the types of civilizations is only one of those three. There can't be any other, right? Uh, it's only those three. Um, and then you have to argue... Um, so you have to argue on its basis. And, and that immediately puts you at a massive disadvantage, right? Because 
when you're at that disadvantage, or when you're already arguing at a disadvantage, it becomes almost impossible to get out of that because the very nature of the assumptions that have already been made insofar as that life is just incredibly difficult to be created um, and, and you know, with life being this difficult to create, it is entirely plausible and possible that we are the only species that have ever existed or that could ever exist. The fact that it puts up these filters, that's an assumption. There's no, there's, there's not necessarily evidence that these filters exist. Um, they could exist, right? It could 100% be that there are filters that humanity or certain civilizations can just not pass these filters. That's not entirely, like... So you could argue that one of those filters would have been a, a comet hitting the Earth, uh, and that would have been a filter that would have destroyed all life on the planet, but we know that it didn't. It did destroy a lot of life, but it did not destroy all life. A lot of life did actually survive that comet hitting the Earth. Um, so one might also make the argument that life is a lot harder to destroy than one might think especially if you know just how bad things were when Earth did get destroyed uh, or when the comet did hit Earth. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm just saying that there are a lot of ways to get around the Fermi paradox if you don't argue on the basis of its assumptions. It's, it's, it's the assumptions of the Fermi paradox that makes it nigh impossible to penetrate. But I don't think it would be... I'm not clever enough to argue against it, but I do think that you could you could do it. I, I think so. Um, so here's part two of that. There are probably 10,000 stars for every grain of sand on Earth in the observable oh, universe. I love Mass we know that there might be trillions of planets, so where are all the aliens? This is the Fermi Paradox. If you want to know more about it, watch part one. Here, we look at possible solutions to the Fermi Paradox. So, will we be destroyed, or does a glorious future await us? Space travel is hard. Although possible, it's an enormous challenge to travel to other stars. Massive amounts of material have to be put into orbit and assembled. A journey of maybe thousands of years needs to be survived by a population big enough to start from scratch. And the planet might not be as hospitable as it seemed from afar. It was already extremely hard to set up a spaceship that could survive the trip. An interstellar invasion might be impossible to pull off. Also, consider time. The universe is very old. On Earth, there's been life for at least 3.6 billion years. Intelligent human life for about 250,000 years, but only for about a century have we had the technology to communicate over great distances. There might have been grand alien empires that stretched across thousands of systems and existed for millions of years, and we might just have missed them. There might be grandiose ruins rotting away on... Uh, wait, does he... <clears throat> Some interesting organic compounds on the red planet that could be signs of ancient Mars life. So organic and act isn't it alive? I'm asking, I'm curious. Well, that's why we're not saying that something is alive. We're not talking about life in that. We're talking about intelligent life forms. I don't think anyone argues that there is life in the universe. Everyone agrees with that. There is life in the universe. The argument here is, is there intelligent life in the universe? Uh, and that would come with, is there human-like beings in the universe? So things that could, well, I guess the argument could also be made, are humans actually intelligent? Because we think we're intelligent, we think that we have intelligence, but it's entirely possible that another alien race looks at us the way that we look at dogs or cats. Insofar as they're cute, they're funny, but they're not really intelligent. Uh, I mean, the most intelligent dog would not be anywhere near the intelligence of a human being. Um, so it could be that they look at us and they think, oh my god, I would love to have one as a pet. <laughs> Distant worlds. 99% of all species on Earth have died out. It's easy to argue that this will be our fate sooner or later. Intelligent life may develop, spread over a few systems, and... Nee, Barry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw something out there. And again, I'm not intelligent enough to know this. 
we make the assumption that the only way life could ever exist is if that life is carbon-based. Because all of the life that we know on our planet is carbon-based. Right? Like, we have never encountered anything that isn't carbon-based that we would consider life. But is it entirely implausible that everywhere in the universe, carbon would be the thing that would be required? I'm not a scientist, so I don't know. But if conditions are different, could you have silicon-based life? Now, on Earth, silicon is species, right? It, it's AI, maybe. But it's, it's generally speaking, we don't consider AI alive. We don't consider it life. I'm just sort of wondering, isn't it possible that you could have silicon-based life form? Uh, or life forms on different planets where the conditions for carbon would, for example, be completely impossible. But for, um, you know, for anything else, it wouldn't be a problem. It could absolutely exist there because that's what, that what is, that's what's needed. Another thing that sort of bugs me a lot of the time is whenever we look at planets and we say, well, there's this Goldil Goldilocks zone. And if you don't, if you're not in that Goldilocks zone, uh, you're kind of fucked. And again, that makes the assumption that whatever life there is must be life that that s sort of came to be in the same way that we came to be. So, you know, we require the Earth to be in exactly that spot in our solar system. Otherwise, we would have been fucked. We would have, it would have been either too hot or too cold. But... Just on Earth, we know of species that can survive in the harshest of environments and nothing ever happens to them, you know? So is it possible that you could have an incredibly intelligent life that evolved in such a way that it can live in minus 200 degrees Celsius and it just does not experience that cold the same way that we do? So its planet is further out of the Goldilocks zone and it survives it. Um, maybe species that can survive much more radiation and heat than we can, and so their planet can actually be closer to the sun, and again, it would survive. I'm not sure, I'm not saying uh, that that is what happens, I'm just saying that that's stuff that I think should be considered, but that's a layman's opinion. There might be a scientist listening to me now going, what the fuck, if I could just talk to this guy, and if you are a scientist, I'd love to talk to you. Just let me know, and I can get you on stream. And die off over and over again. But galactic civilizations might never meet. So maybe it's a unifying experience for life in the universe to look at the stars and wonder, where is everyone? But there is no reason to assume aliens are like us, or that our logic applies to them. It might just be that our means of communication are extremely primitive and outdated. Imagine sitting in a house with a Morse code transmitter. You'd keep sending messages, but nobody would answer, and you'd feel pretty lonely. Maybe we're still undetectable for intelligent species, and will remain so until we learn to communicate properly. And even if we met aliens, we might be too different to be able to communicate with them in a meaningful way. Imagine the smartest squirrel you can. No matter how hard you try, you won't be able to explain our society to it. After all, from the squirrel's perspective... This is where I would absolutely say I really fucking hope that this is not part of what the Fermi paradox suggests. Because on that front, I would say that math. We know now that math is a language. It works the same as languages. and You can absolutely use math to explain just about everything. And based on what we're seeing, math is universal because it shows up everywhere. All, all of our math is based on things that we witness or things that we observe within our galaxy. So I wouldn't need to be able to speak your language. I can absolutely, uh, through math, most likely explain to you how things are supposed to be. So all you would have to do then is look at the way that you explain things, look at the way that we explain things through, through our math, and you'd probably be able to understand each other eventually. Um, you should be able to. So words, sure, language, sure, but math could probably bridge that. Whereas if you say, imagine the most intelligent squirrel, even the most intelligent squirrel do not does not know math. And that, that's why I wouldn't be able to con communicate with it, because there is just no way to. 
it does not have language, at least not in the way that we have it. And since it doesn't have language and it does not have any math skills, it's just we we could never communicate with one another. But any uh, any civilization that would be able to travel through space almost definitely mastered math, right? This is a possible solution to the Fermi product uh, paradox. I don't understand. How's this a solution to the Fermi paradox, though? If a tree is all that a sophisticated intelligence like itself needs to survive. So humans cutting down whole forests is madness. But we don't destroy forests because we hate squirrels. We just want the resources. The squirrels' wishes and the squirrels' survival are of no concern to us. A Type 3 civilization in need of resources may treat us in a similar way. They might just evaporate our oceans to make collecting whatever they need easier. One of the aliens might think for a second, Oh, tiny little apes, they build really cute concrete structures. Oh well, now they're dead, before activating warp speed. But if there is a civilization out there that wants to eliminate other species... It uh, someone played Mass Effect. If this is not the Reaper for Mass Effect, you can suck my dick. Actually, I'll suck your dick if these are not the Reaper for Mass Effect. Um, I'm Ceases, I'm saying this does not make sense. Like, how is this a solution? It just seems like another problem. It's far more likely that it will be motivated by culture rather than by economics. And anyway, it will be more effective to automate the process by constructing the perfect weapon. A self-replicating space probe made from nanomachines. They operate on a molecular level incredibly fast and deadly, with the power to attack and dismantle anything in an instant. You only need to give them four instructions. One, find a planet with life. Two, disassemble everything on this planet into its component parts. Three, use the resources to build new space probes. Four, repeat. A doomsday machine like this could render a galaxy sterile in a few million years. But why would you fly light years to gather resources or commit genocide? The speed of light is actually not very fast. If someone could travel at the speed of light, it would still take 100,000 years to cross the Milky Way once, and you'll probably travel way slower. There might be way more enjoyable things than destroying civilizations and building empires. An interesting concept is the matryoshka brain, a megastructure surrounding a star. A computer of such computing power that an entire species could upload their consciousness and exist in a simulated universe. Potentially, one could experience an eternity of pure ecstasies without ever being bored or sad. A perfect life. If built around a red dwarf, this computer could be powered for up to 10 trillion years. Who would want to conquer the galaxy or make contact with other life forms if this were an option? All these solutions to the Fermi Paradox have one problem. We don't know where the borders of technology are. We could be close to the limit or nowhere near it. And super technology awaits us, granting us immortality, transporting us to other galaxies, elevating us to the level of gods. One thing we do have to acknowledge is that we really don't know anything. Humans have spent more than 90% of their existence as hunter-gatherers. 500 years ago, we thought we were the center of the universe. 200 years ago, we stopped using human labor as the main source of energy. 30 years ago, we had apocalyptic weapons pointed at each other because of political disagreements. In the galactic timescale, we are embryos. We Today, we're doing the same thing! Wait. <laughs> I legitimately saw a headline of a nuclear scientist arguing that people that are pursuing peace with Russia um, out of fear of a nuclear war is making a giant mistake. Like It could be a mistake to pursue peace with Russia. And I was like, dude, how the fuck is pursuing peace a mistake? When... When you have two fucking nations that have nuclear weapons wanting to go to war, I would say peace is good. I, I, it is absolutely good. Um, PD, how you doing, bro? Thanks for the first time chat. Really appreciate that. Welcome to the channel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We've come far, but still have a long way to go. The mindset that we really are the center. Trickstar, why do you assume that it has to be bending the knee? No one has to bend the knee about anything. You're making an assumption of something that I said that I didn't say. 
I'm not going to argue based on assumptions that you've made. I literally just said that's not why. I, that's why I won't argue the Fermi paradox. I made a claim. I said you should be pursuing peace with Russia. Now you're going. Oh, so you'll just bend the knee? Uh, peace could be can peace could be achieved through compromise, where neither us nor Russia is happy. But at least we don't have nuclear fucking war. And yes. Russia has more than 4,000 nukes. The US has a little bit less than 4,000 nukes. If both of those countries fire off all of their fucking nukes, the earth is gone. You bet your fucking ass I'd be willing to bend the knee to ensure that earth does not get gone. So, yeah. If that means bending the knee, then okay. I think let's do that. Because if we don't, that means that all of this was for nothing. Because, yeah, we, fuck it. We will be destroyed instead of bending the knee. It seems like a fucking good idea to me. Let's go. Yeah, it's weird to me. Everyone says Putin is crazy, but then also he's bluffing. He's crazy, but not crazy enough to use nukes. Who the fuck am I supposed to believe at this, at this point? The universe is still strong in humans, so it's easy to make arrogant assumptions about life in the universe. But in the end, there's only one way to find out, right? Hey everybody, we finally have our own subreddit. Come by for surveys, <laughs> discussions about future videos, FAQs, and stuff like that. No, I'm not. Look, I'm not saying that we should pursue peace at the expense of something else, right? So if Putin came out and said, the only way you guys will get peace is if you give me Ukraine, that's obviously not a, a good exchange, right? That, that's not a good exchange because the people of Ukraine don't want to be part of Russia, so it's not fair. But at the same time, just poking the bear and just sort of going, yeah, fuck you, bro. We're not going to give you anything we're not going to argue with you at all. You can go fucking suck a dick. It is again not necessarily the best way to go about this. You have a nuclear superpower or, or headed by a man that everyone tells me is crazy. But then when the crazy guy says, oh, by the way, I'm going to push the button. Everyone's like, nah, Putin won't do that. That will be completely irrational. It's like, dude, you just told me he's fucking crazy. Like, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> he's crazy, bro. Like he's he probably will push the button because he's fucking nuts. Um <clears throat> Aragost, if you think that no one did anything, uh you really need to go check out some history though. Like it wasn't out of nowhere. Like Russia j didn't just wake up one day and oh, you know what? Let's invade. There is things that worked up to Russia finally invading. Now where I stand on that is that I don't think the things that happened was cause for Russia to invade. Russia thinks that it was. Putin warned. Since 2014, Putin have said, look, guys, can you fucking stop this shit? Stop this shit now. Gave the warning. No one fucking listened. And finally said, fuck it, I have enough. Right? Uh, I've had enough. I'm going to invade now because screw this. We might not agree with what Putin is saying. Right, we we might not agree, but at the actually, Putin's been warning uh, the West about its expansion for twenty years now. Um, for more than twenty years now, actually, Russia have been warning the West stop expanding, stop fucking expanding, and it keeps expanding. So you know, I don't agree with what Russia is doing, not at all. Want to make that fucking clear for anyone that's going, oh my god, he's a Russian apologist, not at all. But to say that this was unprovoked, not entirely. Uh, there was definitely some provocation that happened. His response is a little over the fucking top, right? He he kind of responded with tanks when a letter would have done. <laughs> like you could have just sent an angry letter, bro. You you didn't need tanks. That's <laughs> like as a, as a step too far, actually. But it's still not completely un unprovoked. Um, the Hungarian territories then, and everyone complained about it. Complain about what? I mean, look why fighting and risk all lives uh, from UK when UK was anyway part of Russia for so many years. Oh, you mean Ukraine? But it's not. That's not entirely true. Uh, the Ukraine, 
the people of Ukraine and Russia are very different people. It would be the same as um, America claiming that Canada belongs to fucking uh, America. The Canadians aren't going to agree. Yeah, some people speak the same language, uh, even though a lot of people don't speak the same language, which again is true, but the cultures are also very different. And a lot of people in the Ukraine are culturally probably far closer to that of the West than they are of Russia. So are there parts of Ukraine that's still very Russian? Yeah, of course. Uh, but there's also parts that isn't. So it's not, I can't make that argument either. I don't I don't think that's a fair argument either. Because, look, the Ukrainians wouldn't be fighting the way that they're fighting if they wanted to be part of Russia. So the fact that they don't want to be part of Russia means that I support them not wanting to be part of Russia. Because I support people's ability to self-determine who they want to be a part of. Um, so I, I'll never be okay with, with that. Um that line of thinking that oh but you guys used to be the same country so who gives a fuck <laughs> this was very long ago uh like seriously very long ago and since that time uh ukraine has completely diverged from where russia was uh, i just i think personally that pursuing peace is better than not pursuing peace in my opinion at least um <clears throat> what that piece is going to look like the only thing that i can sort of look at and say maybe that is a solution to the current problem is a uh, a deal in where ukraine sort of declares itself as an eternal um neutral state so similar to switzerland uh ukraine determine uh, the ukraine declares that it will remain uh neutral for all time russia then steps out right uh and before you guys go russia will never do that actually they would putin back in march actually putin and them were ready for that that's the peace treaty that they said they would accept ukraine promises that it will remain neutral it can do business with europe as much as it wants right it can trade with europe it can move its people with europe that doesn't bother but it's not allowed to you to join nato effectively um, I think that's a fair compromise, no? Why is that not fair? Ukraine goes back to normal, the, the war ends immediately, and uh, everyone just goes back to normal. Why is that a problem? War with Russia and the Russian aggression isn't just a matter of Putin. It has to end. Aragos, so what the fuck... <laughs> So your youth So your answer to Russia's aggression ending is what? The destruction of Russia? The death of Putin? You think Putin is the the only one that's going to do this cuz oftentimes taking out the crazy person at the head means that there's a crazier person waiting to take its place. So what are you saying? The world needs to fuck Russia up 100%. Fuck you, bro. Uh, we're going to destroy you. Out of Ukrainian territory. All right, so you want to take a nuclear superpower, push it back into Russia, so you want to find a way to get it out of the Ukraine, and then what? You want to make Ukraine part of NATO? And in all of this, how do you stop Putin from actually pressing the nuclear button? Or are we just assuming that he won't? Oh, Aragos, so you're saying, let's do the one thing that Putin have warned about. Fuck him. You don't care about nuclear weapons? Oh, oh, you think he's bluffing? Oh, okay. No, fuck it. That's easy, man. You know? Guys, let's fucking invade uh, Russia. Let's, let's uh, fuck Russia up. Uh, Aragos said he's bluffing. That's enough for me. I'm convinced. Even though he said uh, nuclear weapons on the table, even though they've done nuclear tests to ensure that they're nuclear ready, it's just bluffing. You know? Who gives a fuck? Um... 
I'm sorry, Aragost, but um, forgive me if I'm not going to take your word for he's bluffing. Unless you can prove that he won't do it, unless he told you personally that, yeah, I, I'm just lying, bro. I'm, I'm not actually going to use nuclear weapons. I just really want them to fucking think I will. Um, if you have a tape of him admitting that, great. Yeah, you have nukes too. Oh my fuck. Oh. Why are you trying to make it worse? Are you, tr Aragost, what the fuck are you doing, bro? Like, that's worse. If it was only Russia having nukes, then Russia could nuke Ukraine and it'd be the end of it, right? One or two bombs and, yeah, a lot of people die, but fuck, who gives a shit, right? At least the world isn't, isn't being destroyed. If everyone has nukes and everyone starts firing them, it's nuclear winter on Earth. The Earth is fucked. Be brave. I don't want to... I don't want the world to end with the fuck you talking about bravery. I, it's not about bravery, bro. It's just about the fact that I don't want the world to end. It's as simple as that. <laughs> Dude, I think Aragost is making a joke, just FYI. I think Aragost is sort of trolling. Because uh, he did actually lol at the end of one of his suggestions. So I don't think he's absolutely being serious about the whole just be brave, guys. It's just going to be nuclear war. Who gives a shit? Uh, so don't get too triggered by it. Uh, I'm just saying it's sort of like I don't want to go I don't want to go through that the just seriously I, I don't want to go through that and I, I think there's a lot of people especially like the fucking leaders and the political leaders that dude they're they're they don't seem to care which is scaring the living fuck out of me but anyways